I guess we'll go ahead and get started here. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third graduate research symposium. I'm honored that I've been asked to open this year's symposium and introduce the 18th president of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, Dr. Shirley Ann Jackson. Today, we are fortunate to have Dr. Jackson speaking about many aspects of her career, highlighting her path in public service. But beyond being a role model for all of us as we consider our future careers, in her current role as president of our institution, Dr. Jackson has demonstrated her passion for the graduate experience of you and me, the graduate students of RPI. Communication and collaboration with the RPI administration has never been better. The Graduate Council has been working as close as ever to ensure that graduate students are heard by the administration and they are listening. Our continued stipend increases over the last three years, the creation of the Dean of the Graduate Experience position, the positive relationship with the Office of Graduate Education, and the goals of the capital campaign and the Rensselaer Plan, all of these marks of exciting times demonstrate how the graduate experience is being prioritized and are part of the vision of Dr. Jackson. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Shirley Ann Jackson. Well, good morning. So I'm really delighted to be able to talk with you this morning. And I want to thank the Graduate Research Symposium Task Force for inviting me. And so I'm glad to have an opportunity to speak with you a little bit at a moment that uh, there's been, and in some cases continues to be, some uncertainty for perhaps some of your lives, whether the question is the taxability of graduate tuition waivers, which we dodged, or the welcome that our nation offers to international students, including those who wish to remain in the U.S. after their studies are complete. But I want all of you to be certain of one thing, and that is that you are highly valued here because you are an essential part of the remarkable Rensselaer research endeavor, and you're actually part of our superb undergraduate experience and of the overall life of our campuses. Now, I understand what it means to be a grad student, having been one a while ago, and many people don't understand the, the differences between what the typical graduate student's life is about and that of the undergrads. But because of that, we then are also concerned about the quality of your experience here as, we, uh, as much as we are about that of the undergrads. So we've made then our clustered learning advocacy and support for students or class for graduate students an institute-wide highest priority. And in that spirit, as uh, Anthony has said, we created the Dean of the Graduate uh, Experience position within student life. We have increased and we've increased again for the next year. Uh, graduate student stipends supported this symposium and opened our off-campus commons uh, as a physical place where graduate students as well as undergraduates and many graduate students live off the campus where you're able to gather and to study and experience class events. I think it's becoming so well used, we're gonna to have to think about how we expand uh, that footprint and I think we're gonna do that. Now we're well aware that in educating you, we're educating the leaders of the future in many different sectors because some of you build your careers and will build them in academia, others in not-for-profit businesses, some in for-profit businesses or in businesses you launch yourselves based on uh, intellectual property that may come out of your work. But some of you may work in uh, government, including in our great national laboratories. And some of you if, uh, may go back to your home countries and work there. But I know that some of you as well may cross many of the, these sectoral lives in your own careers, that you may start in one place as I did and end up somewhere else. And something that I highly recommend, by the way, on the way to expanding uh, one's aperture, and that which allows you to continue to grow both intellectually and, I believe, spiritually. So I've been asked to talk today about my own uh, career path. I call it a checkered career. Uh, particularly as it uh, led me from graduate studies in theoretical elementary particle physics at MIT into public service at the highest levels. And it, indeed, it was during my time as a graduate student that I had one of my first uh, experiences in policymaking. And, but to call it a path might not be entirely the right thing because it may not entirely capture the wonderful uh, career and life that I've had, which has been more shaped 
by the opening of sometimes unexpected windows of opportunity and by my own willingness to step through those windows, however daunting the transition appeared at the time. And I often speak of um, windows in time opening. And so it's a question of whether one is able, willing to step through. And two of those windows opened for me uh, as I was growing up. The first, in fact, was the desegregation of the Washington, D.C. public schools in 1955 after the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education Supreme Court decision. And before that, my sisters and I, our brother was too young, had to travel miles across Washington to go to a segregated school. And so, but this meant that I could attend an excellent school uh, right in my own neighborhood with more competition and with children from backgrounds different than mine who introduced me to new perspectives and, and that really excited me and it, so it was a place where I excelled. But the second event occurred uh, a few years later when the Soviet Union launched the Sputnik 1, uh, the first artificial satellite, which actually occasioned fear among United States political leaders and policymakers that we might be losing the Cold War. Now, you're too young probably to, to have experienced that, but not to not know about it. And so our government responded not just by sparking the space race, which really was a science-based defense race, but, and you know that it culminated with uh, manned missions to the moon. In fact, uh, George Lowe, one of my predecessors as president, was the operations director at NASA at the time that put man on the moon. But Sputnik 1 also spurred a new emphasis on math and science in the public schools from which I benefited tremendously. And in fact, I was tested uh, in the sixth grade and placed in an accelerated honors academic program in the seventh grade. And I finished high school early but stayed around to take advanced courses. And when I graduated from high school, I was my class valedictorian. So I had a very excellent and wonderful uh, educational experience before I entered MIT, where for the first time, oh my goodness, I don't know where they got that picture, but uh, <laughs> that's actually me graduating from high school. Uh, and so it was at MIT where for the first time I experienced some real discrimination as one of just two African-American women in my class. And it was not merely the students who were unwelcoming, and I'm sad to say that was true, uh, leaving me out of their study groups and sometimes even refusing to eat meals with me in the dining hall. Some of the professors as well were equally discouraging. And when I consulted one distinguished professor about uh, my interest in majoring in physics, his advice was, and this is a quote that I've remembered for many years, colored girls should learn a trade. Now that was pretty hurtful and surprising to me since actually I had the highest grades in his class. But I realized that I had, was faced with a choice, either to give in to ignorance or to stubbornly pursue excellence. And so I chose the latter, and so I made physics my trade. And uh, when I was a senior at MIT, deciding where to attend graduate school, the University of Pennsylvania Physics Department, which had invited me, invited me to visit, which had admitted me, rather, invited me to visit, and this was in the spring of 1968 in April. And I fully intended at that point to be a theoretical condensed matter physicist. And one of the physicists whose work in this field most interested me was at Penn. And he was one who had done groundbreaking research in the theory of superconductivity. And you know, there's a distinct distinction now between low temperature and high temperature uh, superconductivity. This was low temperature. Uh, and this was work for which he and his colleagues received a Nobel Prize. But I had, was going to have the opportunity to work with him. And the work in superconductivity was the subject of my bachelor's thesis at MIT. At that time, every undergraduate did a bachelor's thesis uh, to graduate. But then a strange and tragic coincidence uh, actually sent me down a different path. Because as I was leaving Penn that day after the visit, 
in a car with a sorority sister. Uh, on the way to the Philadelphia airport, the radio broadcast was interrupted, and we learned that the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had been shot and later died. And I have to say, we nearly drove the car off the road. So by the time I got back to Cambridge, I knew that I would remain at MIT for graduate school. I had also been admitted there, and they were trying to get me to stay anyway. But I was inspired by the courage of uh, Dr. King, and I felt that MIT was the place where I would have the greatest possible opportunity to change things for the better, uh, for minority students and for women. Now, of course, MIT was an excellent place to study physics, but it actually was not as active in condensed matter physics at that time. So in the end, while a graduate student, I changed my uh, research focus to elementary particle physics. Now, that's, this sacrifice, if it really was a sacrifice, was more than worthwhile because I did love the subject, but it gave uh, me important ways that I was able to influence MIT, and through MIT, our national community of scientists and engineers. And actually, with a group of like-minded students, I formed uh, the Black Students Union. And we presented a list of demands to the administration. Uh, we called them demands in our meetings, but we called them proposals when we submitted them. You know, word choice is definitely an element of persuasion. And Provost Paul Gray, who was a wonderful and empathetic uh, man, who later became president of MIT, listened. Uh, he formed a task force on educational opportunity and asked me to join it. Now that task force accomplished a great deal, and MIT began for the first time to actively recruit minority students, faculty, and staff in significant numbers. It also initiated a six-week summer program called Project Interphase, now Interphase Edge, that helped to prepare incoming minority freshmen for the rigorous coursework they would encounter. Now, the program was open, in fact, to all who needed it, and though I was still a graduate student, I was actually asked to help to uh, design and teach in the physics curriculum. And in fact, in the second year of the program, I was in charge of the physics program. And that was an excellent experience for me. And all the while, I was progressing quite well through uh, my PhD program in physics. Now, the undergraduates that I helped to bring to MIT and helped to adjust to its culture truly excelled. I mean, I could give you a list of where these folks have ended up. And they proved to the world that scientific and engineering talent is not restricted to just one race or one sex or one story of origin. But in, interestingly and importantly, because I had proven that I could address complex challenges in theoretical physics while simultaneously addressing a difficult social policy domain, namely, in this case, the dearth of minorities at MIT, and find practical ways to address it, as well as to work at that point with leaders well above me in years and stature my life changed. And so I stepped through a double uh, window of opportunity that led me to become a trusted advisor to many organizations as while well, all the time doing my research. And so I was offered other leadership roles at MIT and indeed today, I am a life member of the MIT Corporation, which is MIT's board of trustees. Now after obtaining my PhD in particle physics, from MIT, I was fortunate to gain a postdoctoral position at the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory in Batavia, Illinois, or Fermilab as it is called. And while I was there, I worked uh, first on a refinement of my PhD thesis, which concerned what was called a multi-peripheral model, small momentum transfer model for many particles scattering, which was a way to elucidate properties of certain three-body interactions. Um, in fact, the title of my thesis was The Study of a Multi-Peripheral Model with Continued Cross-Channel Unitarity. If you have a week, I'll explain it to you. But uh, Fermilab was a catalyst as well for great friendships as well as for great physics. Uh, in my first year there, I had the privilege of getting to know a theoretical uh, fellow theorist 
uh, Dr. Mary Kay Gaillard, who is a professor uh, emeritus today at Berkeley, who was visiting there at the time from the European Organization for Nuclear Research, CERN. And she persuaded me to spend the next year working with her in Switzerland. Now, of course, the cost of living in Geneva, Switzerland, was uh, considerably higher than living in Batavia, Illinois. But sometimes doors open. As a graduate student, I had had a fellowship from the Ford Foundation. So the Ford Foundation was familiar with my work. And although they did not ordinarily grant at that point postdoctoral fellowships, they awarded me an individual grant for this year, which CERN then supplemented so I could afford to live in Geneva. And at CERN, I worked with uh, Mary Kay on a paper on neutrino interactions and gained, in addition, the invaluable perspective of uh, living abroad. And I had traveled abroad uh, before as I was graduating, getting my bachelor's degree. I actually took a camping trip across Europe. We pitched tents every night. And so we started and crossed the English Channel, started in London, crossed the English Channel, and, you know, went into Belgium and uh, Amsterdam. So we were pitching tents outside, went all the way to Moscow and back. Now, my father didn't think I would ever get a security clearance. I don't know why he thought about that at that point. Uh, but I was fortunately able to tell him years later it didn't affect me. Now, after CERN, I did return to Fermi Lab to complete my second postdoctoral year, which I did enjoy. Although at that point, a, a practical uh, reality uh, intruded as my postdoc uh, was coming to an end. And jobs were hard to come by at that time in theoretical physics and in physics generally. Um, but there were a few opportunities in my original field of interest. Uh, theoretical condensed matter physics uh, in industry as well as academia. Now remember, my PhD was in elementary particle theory. But I had attended, as a graduate student, a theoretical physics summer school at the University of Colorado Boulder. You know, physicists have summer schools and phys you know, scientists do this all the time, like the Gordon conferences and so forth. And so at that summer school, I met Dr. John Clauder. And he was a theorist at the Great Bell Labs in Murray Hill, New Jersey, which arguably is the greatest of all uh, industrial R&D operations in history, among whose scientists are 14 Nobel laureates. And Dr. Clauder then, uh, and I had spent time at the summer school chatting it up with him about physics and so on. And he facilitated an introduction for me to the head of the theoretical physics department at Bell Labs, uh, T. Morris Rice. Uh, and I was invited to come to an American Physical Society meeting in Atlanta, condensed matter physics. And the original plan was for me to come give a seminar. And there's a difference between giving a seminar and giving a colloquium. So if someone invites you to give a colloquium, then you know they're real. So, so I was invited to, you know, initially to give a seminar. But as I talked to Morris Rice, he invited me to give a colloquium at, at Bell Labs. So I did that. Uh, and after I uh, described my work on neutrinos, I explained how I intended to apply my interest in the topological properties of nonlinear quantum field theories in particle physics to certain models of condensed matter systems. So I guess they believed me. So I won a what was called a limited term appointment at Bell Labs. You know, it's like a glorified advanced postdoc. But a year later, after I had started, after I had actually done some interesting research on charge density waves in layered compounds, IBM tried to recruit me. And Bell Labs immediately moved to make me, my position permanent. Now, the point about it is that when one came in a limited term appointment, uh, Bell Labs would kind of look at you about 15 months in or so, 15, 18 months, and then decide whether to offer you a permanent position. But I had done this work, which turned out to be pretty, pretty nice. 
and it didn't hurt that I was working with the head of the theory department. Um, and then IBM made me an offer, so Bell Labs made my position permanent. And I had already met my future husband, so you know all the pieces were falling into place. Now I have to say it was a thrilling period in physics, and early in my tenure at Bell Labs, two of its scientists, uh, radio astronomers, Dr. Arno Penzias and Dr. Robert Wilson, were awarded the Nobel Prize uh, in physics for their discovery of the cosmic microwave background radiation, experimental confirmation of the Big Bang model of our cosmos. And Dr. Penzias later became the vice president for research at Bell Labs. And I, for some reason, he liked meeting with me. So about once a month or so, he would ask me to come and just meet with him and chat with him. And he would talk with me about what was going on. And he gave me some, some advice that has always stuck with me. Because I will say that having gone through you know, MIT and some of the experiences I had had and, and always being, having people be a little shocked if I would walk into the room to give a talk, he said, well, you know, you're going to always have a halo. You know, he says, not because you're an angel, uh, but because uh, people are going to notice you. And you have a choice. You can either get hung up about it, or uh, you can just go in and decide you're going to do the best job you can. And so that has always stuck with me. And I'll tell you how it really hit me a few years later. Now, I'd had a number of uh, professional successes at Bell Labs, uh, developing theories to explain the formation of charge density waves in layered transition metal dichalcogenides, uh, the polaronic aspects of electrons in two-dimensional systems, and the optical and electronic properties of strain layer semiconductor materials. And because of this research, I did receive recognition within the greater community of scientists and was elected a fellow of the American Physical Society and then the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. I, in fact, subsequently served on the governing council of the American Physical Society and on the executive committee of the American Institute of Physics, which is the umbrella organization that covers the American Physical Society, the American Association of Physicists and Medicines, and the American Association of Physics Teachers. But two other windows opened for me during my time as a researcher at Bell Labs that set me down uh, new paths and changed my life, in fact. First, I was asked to join the board of a natural gas company, New Jersey Resources, and for the first time became engaged with energy policy. And as a result, I was somewhat of a natural choice when a recruiter was looking for a new director for PSEG, P Public Service Enterprise Group. You know, and PSEG has the largest utility in New Jersey and one of the largest in the country. And they owned or co-owned five nuclear reactors, and still do. Because of my original background in elementary particle physics, and particle physics is really an outgrowth of nuclear physics, um, I sat on and later chaired uh, for a number of years the PSEG Nuclear Oversight Committee of the Board of Directors, which occasioned my visiting and assessing its nuclear operations quite often. And they would actually send a helicopter to come pick me up near my uh, home in New Jersey and fly me down to what's called Artificial Island, where three of the big reactors are. And I am actually on the board of uh, PSEG today. Now, the second window was government service. I was asked by New Jersey Governor Tom Kane to join the uh, New Jersey Commission on Science and Technology as a founding member. And that commission was uh, created to foster partnerships among academia, industry, and government through investment in disciplines important to new, the New Jersey economy, uh, such as advanced biotechnology and medicine and informatics. And I will tell you, this was in the early mid-'80s. Now, the position was unpaid. I was still at Bell Labs but it required New Jersey State Senate confirmation. And so that introduced me to that whole process, 
but also introduced me to a number of prominent uh, business people and academic and government leaders because the commission was set up where it had uh, the uh, Senate majority leader and the uh, speaker of the assembly on it. Uh, it also had the presidents of the major of the research universities, the president of Princeton, president of uh, Rutgers. And so it, uh, it taught me a lot. Now two governors subsequent to Governor Kane also tapped me for top advisory roles. Um, I was actually appointed to the Rutgers University Board of Governors by Governor Jim Florio, which also required New Jersey State Senate confirmation, and the New Jersey Economic Master Plan Commission by Governor Christy Whitman, and where I was asked to, uh, I was actually a vice chair, and asked to oversee a, 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 a committee that looked at regulatory reform. Now, so we always have in life what I call both witting and unwitting mentors. And frankly, I'm unsure how my name arose when President Bill Clinton was looking in 1994 for commissioner for the United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission, or the NRC. Now, the NRC licenses, regulates, and safeguards vis-a-vis uh, -vis nuclear nonproliferation, the use and export of nuclear technology, nuclear materials, uh, overseas spent nuclear fuel and its disposition, and other nuclear waste. So someone recommended me out of what all these things I had done. But given my scientific background, my government service in New Jersey, and my familiarity with uh, nuclear power plants from PSEG, I was ready for this leap. Now, of course, I did have a moment of disbelief when the White House first called and asked me to send my resume. And they were being a little bit vague for an unspecified position. So I initially resisted, but I'm not crazy. So I did send it. And after I interviewed for a spot as one of five commissioners, uh, Bill Clinton actually offered me the job as chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Now, three years earlier, uh, having missed teaching and advising students, I had actually switched from being full-time to part-time at Bell Labs, uh, gave up being on the Board of Governors and accepted a position at Rutgers University as a tenured full professor of physics. So I actually stepped away from a tenured academic position, and I literally had to resign it to uh, take on uh, the NRC role, which, as all of you can well imagine, required uh, some temerity. Now, suddenly, I had a staff of 3,000 people, a budget of over $500 million, and importantly, responsibility for an organization that oversaw a multi-hundred billion dollar set of enterprises at a time of growing public concerns about the safety of nuclear power, especially in the aftermath of the accident at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in the Ukraine in 1986. In fact, I visited the Chernobyl plant in 1996, and there still was an 18-mile exclusion zone around the plant where no one could live. Um, but the chairmanship of the NRC did play to my strengths as an elementary particle theorist. I certainly understood the nuclear physics, the technology, the associated public policy, and I could work through the complexities of the markets and geopolitical environments in which nuclear power and a nuclear nonproliferation operated, uh, all as a result of my academic experiences, the experiences I had had up to that point. And I remember going abroad for the first time, and this goes back to my discussions with Dr. Penzias, uh, to talk at what was called the uh, Korea Atomic Industrial Forum and the Japan Atomic Industrial Forum. And when I went into the Japan Atomic Industrial Forum, except for some of my staff, a couple of women who traveled with me, it's 2,000 men and myself. And of course, here I am, and I'm going to give this policy speech. But then, I, needless to say, I was a bit nervous. 
But then I remembered what Dr. Penzias said, because clearly I was interesting to them, but I was chairman of the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which carried a lot of weight. So I gave my talk, and it went over pretty well, very well, actually. But early in my tenure at the NRC, I realized and recognized that the NRC needed to reaffirm its fundamental health and safety mission, because there had been problems at the Millstone nuclear power plant in uh, Connecticut where the NRC was implicated, that it needed to enhance its regulatory effectiveness to be fair. You can't do good guy regulation or bad guy regulation. Good guy regulation means you decide people are good guys and then you overlook problems until they build up to something that can really blow up in your face. But equally bad is bad guy regulation, where one decides these guys messed up one time, we're going to give them a hard time forever and ever. So regulatory effectiveness means having that right balance. And the NRC needed to position itself for change. So I actually held public meetings, listened to community concerns, and led the development of, the, of a strategic plan for the NRC, its first ever. It actually took two years. And this plan and a related uh, planning, budgeting, and performance management system that I instituted linked to the plan. Does this sound familiar? Performance plans, Rensselaer plan. That actually ended up putting the NRC on a more business-like footing. And PBPM, that stands for Planning, Budgeting, and Performance Management, still is in use at the NRC today. Now, we also put into place the first license renewal process to extend the operating life of nuclear reactors uh, by 20 years. And I introduced an approach to regulation at the NRC that used probabilistic risk assessment and, and Bayesian statistics on a more consistent basis, uh, which uh, dubbed risk-informed performance-based regulation which actually ended up influencing the nuclear codes and standards of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers and informed the nuclear regulatory programs of other nations. And risk-informed regulation in the nuclear arena persists to this day. And I uh, still, every now and then, get calls about from people from countries that want me to come and talk with them. Now, after meeting early in my tenure at the NRC with my senior nuclear regulatory counterparts, from around the world uh, under the aegis of the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA, and the OECD Nuclear Energy Agency, I actually saw another window of opportunity, the need for even greater international cooperation uh, among senior regulators, nuclear regulators themselves, to avoid disasters such as Chernobyl in the future. So I spearheaded the formation of the International Nuclear Regulators Association as a high-level forum to allow nations to assist each other in promoting nuclear safety. The initial membership of the INRA comprised Canada, France, Germany, Japan, Spain, Sweden, the UK, and the US. I was elected the first chairman of the group from 1997 to 1999, and the group still persists. Its membership has expanded to include South Korea and has China as an observer. Now, along the way, the NRC itself did a lot of work working with companies of the uh, countries, rather, of the former Soviet Union, they call them the newly independent states, uh, Ukraine, uh, you know, all of the Central and Eastern European states to uh, strengthen their regulatory programs. Because when they became newly independent, they were left without sometimes even basic nuclear legislation, you know, a regulatory framework, had no inspectors. So we trained inspectors. They would come to the NRC for six months. We would actually write basic nuclear legislation, help them, and create a regulatory framework. We also did this for the post-apartheid government in uh, South Africa. South Africa was interesting because it actually had a nuclear weapons program, which they gave up, but they still had operating research reactors, so, so we worked with them. And, you know, at the NRC, we also pushed for an international convention on nuclear safety, which uh, was clearly needed in the aftermath of Chernobyl. 
And initially, the US Congress, the Senate, was hostile to this convention. But we did manage to get it ratified. And I'll tell you that Senator uh, Joe Biden uh, had a big effect in helping us to get that through because he was uh, on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, senior. And, uh, but the chair was pretty hostile, but we finally got it done. Now, four years later, another unforeseen opportunity arose and another decision for me. Uh, I was asked to assume the presidency of, of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute by its board of trustees. But I was also asked to continue and serve another term at the NRC and continue as chair. And so the board uh, indicated that they were looking for transformative change at, the NRC, at Rensselaer and for a change agent. And this was after a difficult period uh, during which Rensselaer had had five presidents in 14 years. And so I had the decision to make. And my nomination went to the Senate the same week that I was offered the job here. But you know the choice I made. And so Rensselaer uh, has had a rich history since 1824 of producing outstanding graduates, graduates who designed and built much of the physical and early digital infrastructure uh, of the United States and who made or drove breakthroughs in numerous other areas of science and technology and business and continue to do so. But in 1999, it was not living up to its full potential. And I felt that I could help Rensselaer to reach its promise to become a world-class technological research university with global reach and global impact. But I knew that to accomplish this, the heads of different key parts of the university, we call them portfolios today, uh, would need to reimagine their own domains. So I posed five significant questions to the Rensselaer community in my inaugural address and in the planning document for our uh, strategic planning process. So the first question was, what defines the intellectual core in key disciplines at Rensselaer? Second, in these disciplines, are we in a leadership position? Third, if we are not in a leadership position, do we have the underlying strengths and capabilities necessary to move uh, rapidly into a position of primacy with the proper focus and investment? Fourth, are there areas that are so vital and important that we must create a presence in them in order to stand in the community of world-class universities? Now, I suggested three such areas, two of which were built on existing activities and strengths, information technology and applied mathematics. Now, information technology and applied mathematics have now played into computational science and engineering and what we do in artificial intelligence and machine learning. But one of those areas, the third, biotechnology, uh, represented a new direction for Rensselaer. And the final question was, and this is always the hard one, what areas of current endeavor must we be willing to transform or to give up in order to focus our resources and our energies to create the impact we envision? But I promised that together the Rensselaer community would develop a Rensselaer plan that would answer these questions, steer our choices, and allow us to always choose excellence. Now the Rensselaer plan, named so named, derived from an original plan of study that was laid out by Amos Eaton, which was called the Rensselaerian Plan. That's why it has had this simple name. The Rensselaer Plan, approved by our Board of Trustees in May of 2000, indeed did answer these questions with 144 commitments, or what we call we will statements. And by implementing the plan, we prepared Rensselaer for leadership in areas of research that are of fundamental significance in the 21st century by focusing on signature thrust in, uh, in uh, five areas. And this isn't cover the total waterfront, but you could argue it's undergirding for so many things. In computational science and engineering, biotechnology and the life sciences, nanotechnology and advanced materials, energy, the environment and smart systems, and media, the arts, science, and technology. And with these crucial areas of research, we assembled world-class faculty 
And our faculty today includes members of the National Academy of Engineering, the National Academy of Sciences, and the National Academy of Inventors. We have several professors who serve on key national panels and committees, hundreds of fellows of technical and professional societies, dozens of early career award recipients, and numerous winners of national and international awards. And together, they've allowed us to expand the research enterprise to 100 million in research awards and expenditures, even in a difficult funding climate. And sometimes people say, well, 100 million is not like the 300 million at such and such. But I'll give you an exercise. Go to those schools, take away what comes through a medical school and see what's left. And that'll tell you something. Now, we also work to transform the campus here in Troy with state-of-the-art uh, research platforms that include, of course, the Center for Biotechnology and Interdisciplinary Studies, uh, this center, the Curtis R. Prem Experimental Media and Performing Arts Center, and the Center for Computational Innovations, our high-performance computing center that is out at the Tech Park. Now, this center is named for Curtis Prem, who's a co-founder of NVIDIA, and that's because he invented the basic graphics processor on which the company's built. And he's a Rensselaer grad. He's now a member of the Board of Trustees and, in fact, Secretary of the Board. Now, these inve investments have both elevated our profile as a major technological research university and strengthened both our undergraduate and graduate curricula and all of you that are beneficiaries. But we continue on the journey through the implementation of the Rensselaer Plan 2024, which is the successor to the original Rensselaer Plan. That has 130 commitments, or we will statements. Now, I did come to Rensselaer to effect transformative change. The board hired me because of change I had brought to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And that change has happened and continues to happen. And I committed to Rensselaer, and I've stayed the course here for nearly 19 years. And in taking on the presidency of Rensselaer, I've also kept my pulse on uh, industry, by serving on the boards of leading corporations, including FedEx, IBM, and Medtronic, PLC, and in leading uh, nonprofits and associations, including uh, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, where I served both as president and as chairman uh, back in the early 2000s, and at the Smithsonian Institution, where I served for 12 years, and for the last three years of my tenure, which just ended, I was vice chair of the Board of Regents. Now, as vice chair, I was privileged and honored to speak at the opening of the new National Museum of African American History and Culture, together with, with President Barack Obama and President George W. Bush, uh, with Congressman John Lewis, with Chief Justice of the United States, uh, John G. Roberts, with the Secretary of the Smithsonian, Dr. David Scorton, and with the museum founding director, Dr. Lonnie Bunch. I also had people like, you know, Stevie Wonder play and, you know, things like that, but, you know. But I also have maintained my commitment to policymaking in science and national security. In 2009, President Barack Obama appointed me to the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. It's called PCAST, where I served for over five years. As a member of PCAST, I co-chaired with Eric Schmidt, the then CEO of Google, a major study on advanced manufacturing, whose recommendations, in fact, led to a number of major initiatives and programs across the US government and to industry university government partnerships in key new technology areas that undergird advanced manufacturing. Uh, Congresswoman Nancy Pelosi, when she was the speaker of the US House of Representatives, asked that I serve on the National Commission for the Review of the Research and Development Programs of the United States Intelligence Community. And that experience, among others, led President Barack Obama to ask me in 2014 to serve as co-chair of the President's Intelligence Advisory Board. Uh, that meant that I had to give up PCAST because both of them emanate from the Executive Office of the President. Now, PIAB, as the President's Intelligence Advisory Board is called, assesses issues that relate to the quality, quantity, and adequacy of federal government intelligence activities, an important role at a fraught time. 
given the rise of non-state actors and increasingly aggressive relationship with uh, China and Russia, uh, the nuclear th threat from North Korea, and of course cyber attacks of many kinds. I served as a PAB co-chair until the end of January 2017. Now in the intelligence community R&D review, and especially as co-chair of PAB, I advocated for stronger analytical approaches to the assessment of data, both structured and unstructured, from disparate data sources, work which links to the expertise that we have developed at Rensselaer in data science, uh, data analytics, and artificial intelligence. In addition, I served on the US Department of State International Security Advisory Board from 2011 to 2017, originally appointed by Secretary Hillary Clinton, Secretary of State, and reappointed by Secretary John Kerry. And I served on the US Secretary of Energy Advisory Board from 2013 to 2017, appointed by Secretary of Energy Ernie Moniz, where in fact I co-chaired a study on the future of high-performance computing, including data-centric, neuromorphic, and quantum computing. And that is, in fact, guiding developments through the national laboratories and across the government on uh, high-performance, next-generation, high-performance computing. Now, currently, I serve as co-chair of the World Economic Forum Global Future Council on International Security uh, and continue to help steer the conversation on identifying and diffusing threats and on building a more resilient and peaceful world. If you were at the town meeting yesterday, I led in with a discussion on what the geopolitical map of 2030 might look like based on a presentation that I gave in Davos at the World Economic Forum annual meeting this past Jan uh, January. Now, because of what I have been privileged to do, and because of what I've accomplished in uh, my various endeavors, you know, I have received some recognition for my work, including election to the US National Academy of Engineering and the American Philosophical Society, which, by the way, was created by Benjamin Franklin, and election as a fellow of the uh, Royal Academy of Engineering of the UK, and numerous honorary degrees and other awards. But I have to say that the singular honor of my life, of my career, in May of 2016 was to receive the National Medal of Science from President Barack Obama. Now, the National Medal of Science is the highest award given by the US government for achievement in science and engineering. Now, my work in science, technology, and public policy puts me actually square in the middle of academia, industry, and government partnerships and the experience of each realm reinforces my effectiveness in the other. And as president of Rensselaer, as a member of uh, corporate boards and a leader in the public policy sphere, I'm actually able to uh, see where the puck is going, you know, as they say, and to support exciting new discoveries uh, and innovation, and most importantly, the people doing the discovering and innovating. There is no innovation without innovators. So if people start talking a good game about innovation, make sure they talk about you guys, and talk about innovators and discoverers. And, but it also allows me to do these things while helping to solve global challenges and continuing to grow intellectually, and that's very important to me. Now, in other words, it's been quite a career for theoretical elementary particle physicists. And although theoretical physics is considered by some to be one of the most abstract of all exercises of human intelligence, ha ha, I would argue that it does indeed offer excellent training for leadership. Because as a physicist, one develops an ability to look at systems that seem to be chaotic, uh, not to impose order, but to figure out how to understand their complexity. And so we get to see beyond the individual phenomena, and to try to find the principles, as you do, that allow us to be both explanatory and predictive. And such an approach is valuable to problems that are not me just measurable in light years or Planck lengths, but those of societal and global scale as well. In fact, whatever field you currently are studying, I want you to remember that you're gaining 
uh, that same ability. And you're gaining a perspective as much as a body of knowledge, a perspective that's crucial as the world uh, addresses complex and interconnected challenges, and one that may well lead you into the kind of uh, checkered career that I've had uh, and into leadership roles. So I would encourage all of you to, you know, be excellent, and that's what you are uh, in what you do, but to stray off the path you've set for yourselves every now and then and to accept an opportunity outside of or as a supplement to your chosen field if it promises to offer a greater context for what you do. And when a window of opportunity opens abruptly, it may startle and maybe delight you, but you should always assume that you have the capacity to learn and to do something even greater than what you're doing. But I would urge you as well to do everything possible to develop those skills that are necessary to leadership roles that you're likely to be offered in the future. And these include communication skills that will enable you to persuade others and to, to lead a team, as well as an ability to budget and to manage people and projects. I would urge you also to develop the intellectual agility to apply your knowledge and ideas in unfamiliar domains, and importantly, a sense of empathy for people who appear to be unlike you. And this will allow you to collaborate broadly and to steer those collaborations or be a great member of those collaborations and therefore to make a great positive difference in this world. You know, my father used to always say to me, aim for the stars so that you can reach the treetops and at least you will get off the ground. In other words, if you do not aim high, you will not go far. And this holds true for each of us as individuals and for all of us as a species. And the advanced studies in which you're engaged represent the very highest aims of humanity. And the pursuit of knowledge is more crucial than, other, than ever. So I want you to keep reaching for the stars too because the rest of us actually need the light that you will shine on dark corners and the solutions to difficult challenges that only you will be able to illuminate. And so I want to thank you for allowing me to tell my story this morning. And I would uh, be delighted to answer one question, because they're telling me I got to go. <laughs> Can I answer a question for any of you? If not, I'll drop the mic. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>